Hello, Professor Jordans. How are you? Good, good, Priya. Nice to be with you. Uh, thank you. You too. Uh, thank you for taking your time and joining us here today. Yeah, no, it's fun. I look forward to it. This will be good. Awesome. Um, now, this uh, whole COVID-19 is gra uh, uh, taking everybody away from different aspects. Now, obviously, a lot of people are uh, concerning about the physical aspect of the health, you mm -hmm. know, getting the virus, not getting the virus. It's quite, definitely quite lethal for a lot of people, which is unfortunate. But I've been all, always, um, quite for a long time, I've been thinking about uh, this from the aspect of uh, mental also health as well, which you're an expert here. And um, yeah, I mean, I this is my perspective. This is me thinking out loud, basically. But I always feel like um, as unfortunate as this, this whole thing is, eventually it will, for a matter of months, whatever, eventually it will find its own equilibrium, whatever that is. Um, but um, I'm worried that the mental aspect of this will outlast the pandemic itself. Um, and uh, yeah, it can transcend uh, that time. And also it, it will have a potentially individual, obviously, but potentially uh, societal and you know, uh, maybe world impact uh, later on how we're going to think about things. Yeah. So, uh, let, 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 let me stick a hint of optimism in there. Um, so, so, you know, yes, I think that these are extremely challenging times psychologically. The, the optimism, I'm all, all about silver linings these days, where the optimism is, um, you know, if you're not anxious right now, you're not paying attention, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so mental health is no longer, or, or mental unease, let's say, is right. no longer just something certain people experience. We, we are all very anxious. So mm -hmm. the potential silver lining is that, we actually take the time now, we have the time to learn what this anxiety response is and to learn some relatively simple coping strategies for dealing with it so that you know maybe that lingering effect is a, a bunch of people who have now a, a better ability to kind of take control of their mind um, and and be driving their psychology a little bit so that you know that's the hopeful side that, right. that no, this is good. an opportunity yeah no so the linings are great I think they're, they're great <laughs> we need them especially now yes we do All right. <laughs> All right, so let's get started with, okay, so why do you think from your perspective that this COVID-19 has been more um, uh, disruptive than previous uh, pandemics in our recent history? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is amazing. And, and it, it honestly took me a while to kind of understand why so many leaders were willing to take such extreme steps um, at, at a time when it was, you know, admittedly a little ambiguous what the right thing to do was. And so to totally shut down the economy seemed... Um, really extreme. Mm -hmm. However, uh, you know, once we kind of understood at some point that, that this pandemic, unlike others, had the ability to completely overwhelm uh, healthcare services. Mm -hmm. And uh, as many people say, that would have taken down the economy anyway. Um, so if we had right. just sort of allowed it to, to go. Um, but the funny thing is, psychologically, it's not funny. Um, the, the odd thing is the, the prescription that we all are being asked to take, you know, the isolation really goes against our primary coping strategy, which is, you know, when we suffer anxiety or, or stress or grief or uh, anything like that, we reach out to other human beings and emo emotionally connect with them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the strongest version of that would be a hug, reaching out to hug someone. My dog is upset by some animal in the backyard. <laughs> Lola, <laughs> welcome to the new world. Um, so, uh, you know, oh, it's a squirrel. Yes. Uh, <laughs> she's loving it. Um, so, yeah, that, yeah, I'm completely confused now. What was I just <laughs> saying? <laughs> I, actually, I, I lost it too. I think we're talking. <laughs> we may have to skip that. Yeah. Yeah. No, cool. it's okay. uh, I think you were talking about. Uh, 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 the, the economy after that. I oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah. I mean, I take issue with the term social distancing um, because mm -hmm. this is, that's not what we need right now. We need physical distancing. It's the, right. the disease travels through space, not through our social networks. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in fact, we need to come socially together. But I think that is what's made this such a difficult thing for us. Is you know, we're saying, people are saying, here's what you have to do. And by the way, what you have to do will deprive you of your primary way of coping with what we're telling you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so I think we all now have to, and, and literally, I'm pretty heavy on this word, we have to learn um, how to control our anxiety. Uh, because if we allow it to continue for so too long, there's a lot of great work by Hans Selye years ago um, for chronic stress or chronic um, activation of this fight or flight system, which is what mm -hmm. it is. Uh, it eventually wears down our immune system. So if we allow the anxiety to just rule, 
we will eventually become compromised in our immune system and, and therefore wide open to catching the virus ourselves. So, mm-hmm. so you know, we really have to take the time now. And, and the good news is it's not that complex a system mm-hmm. and it's not that hard to learn to control it. Uh, and there's certainly no, you know, Freudian voodoo involved. What we're talking about is physiology. Uh, it, it really comes down to our basic physiology and, and being able to control it, much like, you know, a guru Although they're they're more extreme, but we hear these stories of a guru who could slow their heart rate down to the point where they almost seem like they're they're dead. Um, you know, using the mind to control the physiology of the body. That's an extreme case, and they spend years learning how to do that. But a much less extreme case can be learned much more quickly. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, so what do you think is the primary reason for this whole psychological toll we are experiencing? Yeah, well, let, let, me, let me give you just a, a taste of the, the, what the system's supposed to do, and then we'll talk about why this is so nasty. So it's right. really meant, you know, most of the time our bodies are in this what we call parasympathetic mode, which, which is when the body focuses on things like digestion, getting nutrients out of food, separating the waste, delivering the nutrients to the body, kind of like maintenance on our, on our body. Um, but let's say a predator suddenly, you know, jumps out of a bush our bodies can go into the sympathetic mode. And when it goes into the sympathetic mode, digestion stops and the body is prepared to either fight or flee. So we breathe faster, our heart beats faster. That's getting blood all through our body. It's delivering oxygen to our muscles. It's making us very strong, but it's also giving us that that sort of energy. And, And the idea is we're supposed to use that energy to either fight this predator or get the heck away from it. Either way, whatever happens is usually over in like 10 minutes. Uh, And when it's over, then the system can relax again. The problem is the predator nowadays is COVID. Um, We don't even really understand what it is. We know it's very dangerous. We don't know how long it's going to be around and it ain't going nowhere. Um, And so we can't flee it. Um, It seems impossible to flee. It's unclear how to fight it, but but I think we are, part of my advice is we have to realize that some of the things we're doing are, is fighting it. We have to tell our body because this fight or flee system kind of comes up with this imperative, do something. It's like right. we're, we're driven. We have to do something. Yeah. Uh, and so one of the parts of the psychological well-being is, is convincing yourself you are doing some things, mm-hmm. that, that, that certain things like staying home is a, actually a very powerful way to, to have an effect here. Right. Um, but yeah, that's the feeling. So that's what we all have is this chronically engaged fight or flee system. Um, and it's, it's especially bad because of all the ambiguity, you know, we will hear it's going to be over. And if the worst is two weeks from now, and then a little while later you hear, well, we could be doing this till, you know, 2022. (laughs) (laughs) So there's this ambiguous stuff that our brain does not like our brain likes to predict the future and it it can't right now. Yeah. And the fact that the active uh, fight thing that we can do is to remain passive kind of to a degree. Yeah. It's yeah. a kind of a paradox that we don't appreciate, I guess. <laughs> it, it is. And, and I actually highlight when, it, when I talk about, you know, how families should talk to children, I, I think it's very important to, you know, not say the following, to not say, you know, we're hiding out at home because there's this evil virus and we don't want to catch it. You know, mm-hmm. It sounds sort of like a hiding away um, thing. Uh, instead, it's much better to say to children, you know, you are not at risk probably hardly at all. And even we, the parents, are probably not at that much risk. But there's all these other people in the community that are, uh, and there are these healthcare workers that are on the front lines that are working right. really hard. And so what we're doing here by staying home is, is sort of actively um, doing our part to keep the viruses small, kind of like we're all fighting to keep the sucker as small as we can keep mm-hmm. it. And people do have to play that mental trick because just as you said, it feels passive, but yeah. you have to convince students this is active. The more active you can make it, uh, the better, by the way. I, I also suggest things like, uh, if you have a young family and if you know somebody who's older, who may be alone and maybe isn't very tech savvy, mm-hmm. if you could adopt a person or two and just commit to calling them every day and tell your kids, you know, we're doing this for these people. They need some social support. They need to know we care. So we're going to do this. That feels more active. And you can tell the kid, you know, this is part of how we are, are fighting the virus as well. So yeah, if you can come up with active things that feel like, you're doing something because that's what your body is screaming. Do something. Um, If you feel like some way to do that, then that's very powerful. Mm, Interesting. Good to know. And um, now there's the, the, all of this raises the question, is there any direct, indirect, some sort of a link between how deadly this pandemic is and how 
how much panic people get and like yeah so nearly uh, otherwise yeah sorry go ahead yeah no absolutely um so one interesting i'm going to pick on a word you said because i think it's an interesting word and it's something i'm thinking about quite a bit which is panic um we actually haven't seen you know it's we, we can talk about how horrible this is and it is horrible from a psychologist's point of view i'm amazed at how compliant people are and have been you know um we we see these people who aren't physically distancing and, and they annoy us and they should. Um, but they're actually a minority. Um, the vast majority of people have, have agreed to this, you know, extreme, extreme change in their whole life. Um, lack of finances in some cases, you know, losing their, their money. Uh, and so by and large, the lack of panic is impressive. Uh, other than toilet paper, maybe we haven't seen a whole, <laughs> whole lot happening, but it's something we have to keep our eyes on I, again. And, you know, when I look at the whole world, I, I heard a story, I can't remember where it was. There was some place where there was a, a riot in response to the government telling people to stay home. And I think it only happened a little bit and, and it fizzled out. But um, yeah, so so we're, we're not seeing that. Um, but, you know, I think with respect to the the chance of death, I, I worry about older people in, in, in that regard, that, that people who are younger and relatively healthy don't feel a fear that um, mm -hmm. they are personally going to be impacted. But if you're 70 or 80 uh, right now, I mean, it's another level. It's a whole, like none of, most of us will say we don't want to catch it because we'd hate to give it to somebody else or something like that. We're not so worried about ourselves. But if you're 70 or 80 and you catch it, that could be it. Uh, and so for them, the, the threat is, is far more real, uh, mm -hmm. far more of a mortal threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is a chance that, that that could really psychologically be, you know, a harder stone to carry for a lot of older folks. And, and, and they may be the hardest ones to reach through social connections and other things too. So I am concerned about, uh, about a lot of uh, older folks uh, for that reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you, so specifically to those people, do you have anything specific that you are otherwise to, like you mentioned that younger people can call them, that's good, yep. but uh, specifically if you're just talking to that group of people, is there anything you wouldn't want to say to them? I'm, I mean, I, I would say don't be shy on your side to call other people. Um, you know, if, if you have a little, if you're like most older people, you probably got a bunch of numbers written in a, in some sort of flip thing or whatever. Um, go through the numbers, uh, different days, pick two or three people. Um, and, and it's maybe old friends and, and maybe people your age who may be in your situation. Um, if, if you can get a sort of buddy group going where you just agree, you know, you're going to touch base with each other now and then through the day, that can really kind of give um, some of these people something to think about, something to look forward to. Um, and, and it can make them feel less alone while they're alone. So those social connections are great. The other thing I would say for, for these people, and I say this, um, in the course I have about managing anxiety, I talk about strategies. And one of the things I claim is you have to get away from the anxiety. You can't, you can't just um, have it running away all the time. And there are easy ways to get away. You can distract your mind. And for an older group like that, especially if you have somebody in your family maybe that's like that, find the music that was um, – you know, popular when they were in their 20s, um, you know, somewhere from 16 to 26 or something. If you can figure out what music, you might not have heard of any of this stuff, but you play that music for them, create a little playlist, do what you can to get that music into their environment. It will transform them. Um, it will make them smile. It will make them sing. And those are all positive. They, they release things into the body, the endorphins that are, that are fighting the anxiety response. And so those people need a break from the anxiety and music is just all powerful in that mm -hmm. regard. And if you can find the right music, the music they know and that they haven't heard for years, that will light them up. Um, and so that's just one little strategy I would toss out there. Okay, that's actually great. Never would have thought of that. <laughs> now, you mentioned that sometimes we need to get away from it and distract ourselves. Now, that brings me to my next question, actually. Is yeah. news helping yeah. this? Like, is it making it worse? And if yeah. so, should we stop or limit? I mean, I guess to a degree you can't stop because you have to know what you should comply with or not. But uh, should we limit our exposure to news media and other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. So that's exactly, when, when we talk about the simple strategies, what ends up in your mind gets there two ways, either internal thoughts, something internal pushes something into your mind or the world, um, you know, brings something to you. And so we can use the world to change our mind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if we look at, I guess, the negative side, so the news I would put on the negative side, and it's a fascinating thing in a time like this, because there's so much uncertainty, we become information addicts. 
And, and I mean that in the, in the same way you're addicted to your smartphone. Mm-hmm. If something delivers you rewards on a sort of random basis, and so you know somebody just shared your post, which makes you feel good. Um, and so that's great. You put the phone down, but somebody might share it immediately right after you put the phone down. So maybe you better check to make sure somebody hasn't just shared it again. And if you never know when that's going to come, you keep checking. And, you, and so now we have, we want information. We want to know what's going on. And the news delivers us that information. And so we will have this natural tendency to want to keep checking and keep checking and keep checking like our phones. But every time you look at the news, your brain is, is getting this message. You are under threat. There is this nasty thing out there. And so it's feeding the anxiety and it's getting you anxious. So, but as you say, you want that information. So what do you do? You, you budget it. Um, what, what I claim is, you know, maybe a couple times a day, you actually budget times in your day where you say, okay, I'm going to consume the news at that time. But do things like if you have any news apps on your phone, turn off those notifications. Like mm. don't let the news control you and get you know control your mind. You say, okay, I am going to allow you into my mind for a while. Mm. Um, I then claim once you're done watching the news, you should use what, what I'm now calling a sort of a cognitive palate cleanser, kind of like when you eat some food and then you will eat something neutral to, to kind of get that taste out of your mouth. After you watch the news, plan to watch something else that will engage your mind. And that'll be different for all of us. Um, but, but if there's something that you watch on TV or something that, you know, playing a video game or, or, or whatever, if it pulls your mind away from anxiety, learn what those things are. Mm-hmm. You know, pay attention to those. Oh, when I was like, for me, it's garage band and, and playing with, um, you know, musical stuff in the basement. When I'm doing that, everything else goes away. And so if you learn those things, those things become powerful levers for you. Watch the news do one of those so that, you know, you let your head go there, but then you pull your head back away from that. Um, so, so that kind of thing can be how, you know, when, uh, when I talk about living in isolation, that's the sort of trick is to sort of budget your day, schedule your day and, and put in good stuff along with the anxiety stuff. Cause we're not going to get rid of the anxiety we, the goal is to manage it, um, mm-hmm. not to lose it. You'll never lose it. Okay. Fair enough. Now, we mentioned the old people, like um, age groups aside, are there any types of people that are more susceptible to being uh, more struggling with this? Yeah, so I get asked this question a lot. And, and I mean, the, the truth, the absolute 100% truth is we've not done any psychology experiment, anything like this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when, when we look at isolation, we look at things like um, solitary confinement in prison, which is very different than what we're all dealing with. We'll also look at um, social isolation. So people who have trouble, you know, being part of any group and, and we know what that does. But this kind of isolation is something brand new. Um, and so I get asked by reporters if people are already um, anxious or, or depressed or if they have, you know, issues, are they going to be double hit? And I don't know. Um, I've, uh, I've asked some people that I know. Um, and there are some surprising anecdotes the other way where, you know, one of the things I was told by somebody is I'm not alone anymore. <laughs> I felt like I was the only one suffering from this anxiety thing. And now I have all these friends who understand how I feel. Um, so from one perspective, that was good. And I heard from another person that, you know, they had already learned some of these coping strategies uh, as part of managing their own mental health. Uh, and so now they felt like they were kind of equipped and that there's all these other sort of naive people who suddenly are discovering what anxiety feels like uh, and don't know how to manage it. So it's possible that some of them are better equipped, that it's not hitting them, you know, double hard as we might think. Um, but we're not seeing, you know, nobody's collecting a lot of good data right now, um, which is probably a shame. Uh, it probably would be good to be collecting some good data. So I don't, I don't know if we know, we know things like abuse is up. Um, you know, a lot of that kind of, so there's, there's stresses that come with being stuck in a place with a person, um, that may exacerbate any anxiety or depression, but I don't know if the isolation itself. Yeah. We, we just don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fair don't. enough. Now that, that, that's, that's good. That's good. Actually. I admire that. And that's one of the yeah. things I admire in science. If we don't know, we just say we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> Figure it out soon, hopefully. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Um, on the other hand, as you mentioned, there are a bunch of people, like group, maybe minority, that really don't take this seriously. Uh, yeah. Now the question uh, arises, uh, why is that? And is it just yeah. because they don't believe in danger or do they think they're immune? And is it as bad as being yeah. over? So, so there, there's, there's some psychology we can bring to bear on that, which is, which is kind of interesting. The first thing I want to I wanna sort of throw out there is I think for some, for some people, it is sort of a macho thing, and I can't wrap my head around that, to be honest. Like I, I think of, oh, a hurricane's bearing down, and you see those people who are out on the beach, even though a hurricane's coming down. 
that's kind of okay, I guess, because it's you're risking your own life. And if you want to be an idiot and risk your own life, that's that's one thing. Yeah. Um, but the problem here is, you know, I, I really think of this virus as a monster that's that's growing, mm -hmm. that the healthcare community is trying to fight. But if it grows too big, they're not going to be able to fight it. Uh, and so most of us are doing our best to try to keep the monster small where these people are feeding the monster and they're feeding the monster themselves, their families, their friends, families. Uh, and I almost think they need an image like this. I, I'm a big fan of, you know, rational argument doesn't work sometimes with people, but just depicting them as the person feeding the virus and making it bigger while the healthcare people are getting, you know, attacked by it. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they should, should think of it. So why, you know, don't they get there? There's a, there's a, a really funny set of um, psychology experiments that were started by someone called Leon Festinger, um, and it's come to be known as cognitive dissonance. But the, the, first, the story of his first study is, is um, a good one. I like it. He was um, doing his daily thing. I think he was in New York, and there was somebody who was gaining some prominence who claimed that the world was ending. Um, she knew this because she was in contact with aliens. She would go into a trance and the aliens would speak to her and she would write with her non-dominant hand stuff and, and whatever she wrote, that's, that came from the aliens. Uh, and so the aliens basically said the world was coming to an end. They gave an exact date, but of course they were going to bring a spaceship down and, and save a few people who um, followed her. Uh, and so a bunch of people did. This is what Leon Festinger was kind of interested in. A bunch of people sold all their stuff and you know went to hang out with her and waited for this date and and leon being a good psychologist said i wonder what they're going to think about the day after um uh -huh. i, I want to talk so he figured out who these people were and he made a point the day after the world ended to to go seek them out and the question was would they all say oh i was an idiot so let's imagine you know the people who said oh it's not going to be that bad this pandemic isn't going to be that bad you're all overreacting yeah. um what he found when he talked to these people is the day after they did not think they were idiots. Um, they in fact felt like something had gone wrong. Of course, the person was now in touch with the aliens and the aliens had postponed the date or something. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what had happened, but they were very willing to believe all of this stuff. They were very unwilling to accept that their original position was a stupid one. Right. Humans don't like, um, telling ourselves we're stupid and we'll twist the facts and we'll twist all sorts of things uh, to do that. And so I think for a lot of people, you know, back when we were talking about how extreme that, that choice was to shut down the economy, there's a lot of people that were obviously very personally affected by that and who probably felt that was just too extreme, that, that it was too extreme for the, for the actual danger. Um, now, of course, since then, we've seen like New York healthcare system basically almost on its knees. And so the vast majority of us who had any doubt about that um, are, are now on the side that I guess it wasn't too extreme. I guess it was necessary. But if you were loud and vocal early in the days, if you were someone who said, you guys are all idiots, this is too extreme, blah, blah, blah. Humans have a hard time walking away from that. Once they take a position, they have a hard time flipping it. So I think some of these people are are still kind of hanging on to that notion that, no, it's not really that bad. And you are still all being too dramatic about this. Um, but I don't know. I mean, as they do that, they're feeding the monster. So, so to me, it's, it's almost that, that's why rational thought, like trying to speak to these people rationally sometimes is hard because they'll, they'll listen to what they want confirmation bias and they'll mm -hmm. hold on to the things that fit. Um, and that's where I think a good image can go a long way. Um, yeah. You know, a good little graphic or cartoon that kind of mm. says, you're this, you're this slimy guy in the ad. <laughs> is, is that who you want to be? Yeah. <laughs> Up to you, your call. Maybe, yeah. maybe he knocks them out, who knows. Yeah. Uh, now, I had a, a friend of mine actually uh, heard about this conversation that I'm going to have with you and asked this question that I want to ask on his behalf. And is there mm -hmm. such, a thing, such a thing as types of anxiety? And if so, is it important in this scenario or is it just anxiety? Well, I mean, there's that basic anxiety response that I talked about, which is basically just the fight or flee reaction. Um, there are people, so right now this is being triggered by a real threat. So, so in fact, this is a very natural reaction um, for us all to have. It's just not good when it's extended, as I talked about. Um, in the pre-COVID world, um, other you know, people who suffered from anxiety issues there would be triggers and, and the triggers could be very different uh, for a lot of people. For example, well, we can all relate this on a small scale. If you've ever had to network, um, there's, there's what we call the social anxiety. Right. Uh, you know, if you ever had to go talk to a bunch of people you don't know and try to represent yourself well in a networking kind of event, 
any of us find that stressful. We, we all find that anxiety, uh, anxiety provoking. Uh, we can learn strategies and we can figure out how to do it. And we can see the value in doing it. You know, for some people that can happen when it's one other person they have to talk to and not a room full of strangers. So it can be any, they're, they're, they can start to think, um, I'm going to say something stupid. I'm going to make a fool of myself. This person isn't going to like me. And so they can start worrying, you know, before they even open their mouth and before they even have a conversation, they can start having these negative thoughts about consequences that could happen and that could make them literally fearful um, and, and invoke that. So depending on who you are, um, different things. It, it's the same basic response, but, but it can uh, sort of play out in very different contexts. So here's another funny example. I'll, I'll, I'll throw out just to, you know, give the sense of the importance of thinking as we go. So at UT Scarborough, um, where, you know, our, our home, one of the things they do at the uh, exam time, um, that I find kind of humorous, um, knowing how multicultural UT Scarborough is, they, they have a room full of puppies. And the idea is, while you're all stressed out for exams, oh you know, this would be a great, go hang out with the, the dogs and puppies and this will make you feel better. And I think, well, yeah, for some, for some, <laughs> for some students, that's the most terrifying idea in the world to walk into a room sure. full of dogs and puppies. Yeah. So, you know, it's not the dogs or, or, or puppies. It's the way you think about them and, and, and the thoughts they, they put. So if you think they're all cute, then that's putting you into one state. If you think they're potentially dangerous and, you know, and could bite you at any moment, that's putting you into the other state. Uh, so it's really about the sort of thoughts that come along with these activities. And if those thoughts trigger our amygdala, which is like our spider sense, it's the thing that senses, senses potential danger, then we go into that fight or flee response. Um, in an extreme case, by the way, let's mention there's one other situation. There's something called a panic attack. And a panic attack is sort of a different kind of anxiety in the sense of it's kind of that amygdala, that spider sense going off for no reason. So some people, it's just a little too sensitive. And, and so it's like your brain senses danger and it's telling you you're in danger and you're looking around and you don't see the source of the danger. You're not sure why your, your body is, is readying you to fight or flee. That can be double terrifying because now you don't know where to run away from. You don't know where the danger is. And so some people in those situations, really, it can, it can sort of cycle and they can get really, really, really scared. And, you know, imagine you're on a subway train, so to speak, and this starts happening. Mm -hmm. When those train doors open, somebody with a panic attack would just bolt out of the train, bolt out of the train station, go out in the road somewhere, and would just be sort of running to get away from something. something. Uh, and, and that's a very sort of extreme version. Um, th those, those people feel like they're going to die. They literally have this sense that I'm about to die and I don't know why. Um, so that's, that's kind of a special form. It's still the same basic mechanism, but when you can't find the danger, it's almost worse. Okay, fair enough. Now, have you, do, you, do you think it will relate to the situation in a sense that, okay, we know what it is, but I don't know. Like, you know, it's, it's, yeah. I can't see it. Is, yeah. that, is that something that might happen to people? I, I, I think of all of this uncertainty, yes, that you can't see it. Uh, and by the way, there's a really weird, you know, almost getting back to your psychological impacts thing. We're, we're starting to we're starting to have a disgust reaction towards other human beings, <laughs> which is <Yes>. really odd. <laughs> so, you know, I'll be walking my dog and if someone, and the paths are only so wide. Yeah. And, and if somebody, I just see somebody coming, just the fact that somebody's coming my way makes me go, Oh man, <laughs> it's like, it's like suddenly humans are being, you know, this source of distrust and disgust yeah. and, and potentially dirty, maybe carrying yeah. the virus, maybe not. Um, and I don't know how that will play out, like how yeah. we're, how we're going to, to carry on, uh, with that afterwards. It, uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird, yeah. fascinating I, world. I heard different things about this actually. So like in terms of predictions, right? yeah. not from the experts, but random people uh, hypothesizing yeah. and some people were like, yeah, this is going to be devastating. People are going to hate people for a long time. <laughs> and then other people are like, no, people are going to be wanting to hug people. <laughs> After all, this is over. I'm, I'm on both sides of that too. I, I said to my wife last night that one of the things that I, that I thought might be fun for some people to start doing is planning what I, what I called um, Liberty Day, you know, with a day when we're all free of all these restrictions. And you can imagine a big celebration yeah. um, of some sort, um, you know, think Raptors parade, but, but bigger yeah. <laughs> at some level yeah. where we're all free. But that is the interesting question. So if you had, let's say we took Toronto Island and we made it into this party central would people come <laughs> would, would the idea of being shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of people you know even on a ferry or wherever yeah 
are, are we mentally able to do that right now? <laughs> um, how long will it take for that to come back? I, I've heard some people talk about the economy, and I wonder if it's similar, where they say, you know, you're not just going to turn, flip a switch in, and the economy is going to be back what it was, mm-hmm. that businesses will have died, there will be a period of time when it'll probably come back, but that period of time is probably years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder, you know, if we defeat the virus, if it doesn't become a seasonal thing or something, if it right. suddenly were gone, let's say tomorrow or ne- next month, I, th- I think human interactions would similarly take a while to come mm-hmm. back. I, I think if the threat was really gone, they would come back. Uh, I don't know about handshaking. Um, right. I, you know, I don't certainly not hugging strangers like we used yeah. to at some point in time. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but I think it will come back, but it'll be slow. And it, it would be funny to see if people are willing to just suddenly like, do, do we feel like we need to be together? Uh, yeah. Because that's a very psychologically normal feeling too. Mm. But we've had all that disgust <laughs> thrown on top of it and, yeah. you know, steering away from crowds yeah. uh, and it's becoming habit. Right. And once it becomes habit, then, then it's pretty ingrained in our body and it takes a while to undo. Yeah, for sure. No, it's definitely, I, I initially, I didn't intend to do that, but I I feel like if I don't do it, it seems like something's wrong with me because everybody's doing it. I guess anyways. (laughs) So I think it's as good a time as any. So for those people who don't know, you have a course that is free Mm -hmm. on Coursera called mind control, managing your mental health during COVID-19. Now, do you want to, why don't you like just tell us a little bit about what, I mean, I guess people have a good idea what this course is about, but but coming from you. (laughs) So so the mind control part, uh, I always like these weird twist of words and and I have some sort of Jedi references all through and, you know, (laughs) I have this image in my mind of, uh, this may be going back far for some people, but but Luke, when he's finally been all trained and then he's going to Jabba the Hutt to rescue Han Solo, but it's this period where he's actually confident and competent and he's learned all these, these mental skills, these mind tricks, yeah. and then he can just waltz in and, and he's kind of the, the Jedi warrior. Well, you know, that, that's sort of in my mind is you, we need to learn that sort of ability to control our own minds. And, mm-hmm. and it really isn't that tough. So the, the big idea of the course is to empower people with knowledge, to make them, you know, really understand what the anxiety response is. Um, and then when, and then to give them some tips about managing it, tips that will make sense once they understand it. So I think, you know, I, I've told reporters, here's a tip, here's a tip, and, and they get those little tips and that's fine. Um, but when you really kind of get it, oh yeah, that's why that works. Um, it's important because sometimes the tip isn't exactly perfect for you, but if you understand why it works, you can find one that is, Oh, you know, he talked about singing karaoke. I wouldn't do that, but I would do this. And and it's the same idea. So the course is essentially, it's, it's called three weeks, although people are binge watching it. So whatever, but, but it's broken down in three weeks. Each week has about maybe an hour of videos, three or four short videos. Uh, the first week is really about understanding where anxiety comes from um, and why it's so important that we learn to control it. And I end that week um, by telling them about guided relaxation. So basically you can't be both anxious and relaxed at the same time. Uh, It's sort of two different modes our body can be in. So if you want to stop being anxious, the best way to do it is to learn how to be relaxed. And, and if you can invoke some, kind of summon relaxation, that will get rid of the anxiety. And it's something you can learn to do, but it is a skill. It is a you know, mental mind trick, so to yeah. speak. Uh, and so you begin by, I, I give them a little audio tape that just kind of, they just lay down and it walks them through the process. And just to demystify it, just so, so your listeners understand, it's just something like we start at your feet and we say, clench your feet as hard as you can, like it's a fist, like clench that foot as hard as you can, make that muscle hurt and keep clenching and make it really, 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 really hurt. And we say that for a little while. And then at some point, the critical point, we say, okay, now release that tension. And while you release that tension, feel what it feels like when the tension sort of bleeds away, when it's just sort of, you know, drains out of your body, like it's going down a drain and then feel that relaxation that's left in your feet after Mm -hmm. that. And then we go up and we do it with your calves and we do it with your thighs and we work all the way up through your body. Um, and the idea is just, it's kind of it's my sci-fi references again. It's like the teleporter in Star Trek where you want to go from one place to another. It's kind of like you can do that pretty well with your mind if your mind knows that location you want to go to. It has to be very familiar with that location. And if it is, it can transport you there. Right. And so by doing the relaxation, you become familiar with that's what relaxation feels like. That's what it feels like to drain um, the stress. And at some point, 
it can become a Jedi mind trick <laughs> where you can literally, you know, someone says you're a jerk and, and you're about ready to come back at them with some nasty words, but you can just go, no, let me pull that back and let me be rational. And, and that is, I, I call it the psychology of being cool in my class. That's, that's learning how to kind of be con in control of your emotions. So that's a very sort of direct way. In the next week, though, I talk, like we've been talking about a little bit more, about how you can use distractions. So I talk about the news and why it's sort of uh, like we did. Like it's, it's you know, not, not necessarily good for our state, but it's something we kind of need now. Um, but how you can now change the channels on your mind through the activities you engage in. Um, that certain things will be good distractions for you. Other things will actually be like aerobic activity. We've never understood this in psychology. Aerobic activity makes people more positive emotionally. Yeah. You don't know why. Uh, we just know this has been shown over and over again. So if you can factor some of that into your day, um, that will help your mental health. So I give a bunch of strategies like that in the second part. We talk about the importance of social connections, things like that. Um, and then finally, in the third week, we focus really on isolation, this new like living in isolation and what that does to a person, um, what we know from the psychological literature, what we don't know yet, as we've talked about, there's a lot we don't know about this situation. Right. Um, but then I, then I give some advice about sort of configuring your life in isolation and, and how to kind of, you know, have the news in there. But as we've talked about little budgeted bits of news, you know, follow them with some sort of uh, palate cleanser, cognitive palate cleanser, right. have other ones throughout the day, have social interactions as part of what you do, find ways to have control. One of the things I talk about, by the way, in, um, in that third section is if you can accomplish something, mm -hmm. if you can be spending this time and, and maybe bettering yourself, so maybe taking courses online, if there are certain skills you always wished you had or, or whatnot, you can get some certificates or you could just learn about something you always wanted to learn about. If you wake up in the morning with something to do and, and you go bed at night having accomplished something, Mm -hmm. that makes you feel a lot better too. And it's less that you're just kind of hanging out. So I, so I talk about things like that, little things you can do that will literally answer your body's call of do something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also kind of give you um, escapes from the anxiety at times, give you things that work against the anxiety. Uh, and, and the whole hope is that these become things that people just have in their back pocket. So mm -hmm. I, I, I love the idea. I don't know if this is happening, but I love the idea of a family going through this. Um, and literally, you know, involving kids at a very early age in, in terms of, hey, here's how you can kind of control your mental states as well. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, you know, six months from now, that kid's being bullied or something. And, and maybe they feel a little bit more in control of the situation, in control of their emotions. And maybe that allows them to, you know, come up with some strategies they might not have thought about. This is another thing, by the way, it's, it's an interesting thing about this fight or flee system. It's all about activating the body to respond and it actually drains blood from the frontal lobes. It's mm -hmm. kind of like your, your body is saying, this isn't a time to be thinking. It's a time to be doing something, just do something, which makes sense if it's a bear in front of you, right? yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, right. but otherwise it, it's very hard. So if somebody was being bullied, for example, a kid's being bullied, usually they're going to have an emotional reaction and it's very hard for them to think strategically about what, what are the options? What's the best way to respond? What, mm -hmm. what, what could I do? Um, instead, they just let their emotions take control. But if they can push back that emotion and get cool and kind of think their way through, they may actually you know, have a tool that they can use all their life. And so that's that silver lining I, I, I told you about before. I think we all have to learn these tricks now, um, but I think they will serve us well in our, in our life going forward too. So, so okay. it's an opportunity in, in a sense. Fair enough. Now, why is this a perfect time or, or right time rather to? Well, it, I think it's a right time. I, th I think one of the, the, the great things, about this is, <laughs> it's always strange these words say, but is we all are, all are feeling the same thing. You yeah. know, I, I literally tell people, um, if, if you're not anxious, you're not paying attention right now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you, if, if you're clued in at all to what's going on, you, so it's no debate uh, and it's not a mystical thing. So, um, let me say it this way. There, there are still a lot of pockets in the world where mental health is not spoken about, um, where it's seen as, you know, a, if someone's having a struggle, that's something you want to hide. That's something that's shameful. That's something they should be able to control themselves. Um, so we'll say to somebody like, stop being anxious or stop being depressed, but we don't tell them how to do that. <laughs> and, and, and we just don't naturally know how to do that. Um, and so when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about going a step, like even if you feel that way, like this person should be able to do something about their depression. 
well, okay, but at least let them learn what they can do about their yeah. depression. Like, don't just deny them the op opportunity to actually figure out how to do that. Um, and so I think we're in a case now where we're all feeling it. And so it's not us and them, it's us. Um, and it, it's absolutely critical, again, actually for two reasons. One, the one I told you about, that if the... Um, if the fight or flee system stays engaged too long, we become immunocompromised and that's mm -hmm. not good for the virus. The other thing though is, and it worries me, um, anxiety is better than depression, which sounds kind of odd, but anxiety is your body screaming at you, do something. Depression mm -hmm. is your body screaming at you, don't bother, it won't make a difference, nothing does, um, it's not worth the effort. So depression is a real, you know, bad state that leads to suicide and leads to a lot of other very dangerous things. Um, and if we don't learn to manage our anxiety, um, we may end up feel feeling at some point like nothing we're doing is, is helping. There's, there's nothing we can do. This is just going to ruin everything. And that's sort of the path to it's something called learned helplessness. We can start to feel like we can't control the situation uh, and that can lead to depression. And so, mm -hmm that that worries me more than anxiety it's un anxiety is uncomfortable um but it's an activating kind of state uh, and so maybe I'll activate people to learn how to manage their mental states and, and to learn that it's not voodoo you know i think mm -hmm. freud kind of did a disservice to, to psychology years ago he's, he's fascinating to read but he you know gives this impression of little demons in your head doing various kinds of weird stuff and that's not modern psychology modern psychology is much more about habits uh mm -hmm. and you can have habits of mind just like habits of body um, and, and sometimes biases in the way you think about things, the way you weigh things and all of these things make sense when you hear them. And there are, there are approaches to, you know, um, sort of rebalancing the system and, and none of it's voodoo. None of it should be seen as weakness mm -hmm. any more than, you know, somebody jogging. We, we don't think someone's weak because they're jogging. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we think they're actually taking the time to, you know, take care of their body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what I kind of hope people will start to see here that, that this mental health stuff, it's, it's not about fixing a problem. It's about being fit, being ready for a challenge, being able to take things on and, and not having them crush you. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I think we may have the opportunity where enough people are motivated to learn about that um, to actually kind of see what mental health is really about. All right, fair enough. Now, you mentioned the structure of the course being separated week by week. Yeah. Uh, actually, I did not, I started a course, but I, never, I didn't finish it. One of the reasons was because I wanted to ask you this. Is yeah. there, do, do you recommend to go through that week by week or binging is okay to? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I obviously, I, I recommend you go through an order because I do build on some things later on. Um, but I mean, generally, so let me, let me put on my geeky cognitive psychology hat. If you really want to remember it, there is what's, what we call space learning leads to the best memory. So to, to, to learn little chunks and think about those and then wait till you learn the next chunk, et cetera. So generally binging or cramming, that can get you the information for now, but it doesn't hang on as long. Uh, so generally speaking, anytime you're learning, it's better to distribute than to binge. However, um, you know, in this case, I've had a lot of people do the binging thing and they say they've learned lots of great tips and that's exactly what they wanted to get out of it. The good news about this, I mean, as an educator, the good news about this course is it's, it's relevant. Um, you know, students are taking this because they want to know these strategies and they want to understand. And so they're, it's a very motivated, engaged student group. And in that case, all you really need to do is give them what they need to learn. And, you know, if you wanted to binge it, it would probably be, be fine as well. Um, yeah. All right. the, the, one, the one thing I would mention, though, um, that I want to highlight is, that learning to relax, I highlight this through the course, but I can never highlight enough. It's like learning to play guitar. You know, you don't just pick it up and do it. You, you literally have to. So I, I recommend things like, like twice a day, do that guided relaxation thing. It takes 10 minutes, but you know, revisit that place called relaxation a couple times a day and, and then keep doing this for a week or two weeks. You know, it takes a while before you can just mentally put yourself there. Um, and so there are parts of the course like that, that if you, if somebody just listens to it once and gets the concept, well, that's great. They have the concept. They're not going to have the skill, uh, skills only develop with, with practice. So everything people learn, it's less about how you learn and more about, do you take what you learned and use it? Do you start using it in your life? And, and if you're using it in your life, it's going to stick. Uh, and so that's what, that would be my big recommendation to people is, okay. is literally leave the, the thing saying, Oh, I know three ways I can do that and then do that. Mm -hmm. 
No, that's yeah. fair. I think that uh, anybody who's done any kind of learning, especially with uh, instruments or whatever, can, yeah, can yeah. relate to that. Definitely, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Now yeah. we're coming to the end of the uh, the episode here, and I want to see if there's anything we missed and you want to talk about. Any final yeah. advice for the audience? Wow, I mean, there's there's so many angles on this. So I have reporters call me and ask me all sorts of questions and so many things. So there's there's probably things we haven't discussed, but I think we got the um, the main gist of it. I, I think the things you know I, I would really like the listeners to to kind of grasp on is is uh, this is a relatively quick experience they can go through. That you know if you think of it in that Jedi way, you know how long did he spend in the swamp with some great little green guy learning to do stuff? <laughs> this would be a whole lot less time yeah. uh, that you'll spend, and and I really think um, it will be valuable. I, I really think there are tips in here that will make you feel better. And, and that's why I'm you know, trying so hard to kind of get it out there. Um, and so, yeah, I just hope people listen to it, use what they listen to. And, and I really, really hope that, that it gives them a little bit of peace of mind, a little bit more control over their mind. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And uh, I, from going back to the silver lining that you mentioned, I think actually, and as I, I keep telling myself, I was like, I always thought to myself, there's so much books I want to read or whatever that I yeah. never get a chance to and now this is a perfect chance, but like I have a friend who was telling me that now that I have the chance, I'm just like, no, I was like, was that just an excuse? Not to <laughs> yeah, it was that? an excuse, not a chance. <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, in a sense, it's a great opportunity for those of us who are staying healthy. I mean, obviously yeah. there are those who are impacted very badly, but it's an opportunity for other people, other that are not so impacted uh, that to yeah pick up on those and these skills specifically this that you're mentioning and and that and that'll make you feel a lot better in and of itself just just because i mean it's 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 a anti-victim kind of it's right. not like you're a victim of the situation yeah. it's like you're someone that's like okay this is the situation how can i use this to my advantage and, mm -hmm. and that's a very different place to be psychologically and in a much more healthy place to be psychologically so you know sometimes the way we frame things to ourselves makes a big difference, and, difference. and i think that's a good example Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, agreeing to come, come up here. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the invite, yeah. Buya. And uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, me, yeah, me too. For me too. Uh, it was awesome. And hopefully, we're going to hope that this thing goes away quickly. But uh, yeah. assuming it doesn't, I hope we can count on your expertise further. You know where I am. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Buya. Have, Have a good, good day. Bye-bye.